from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now, I want to talk a little bit to people that are watching by television and say a word about New York City, because a lot of people don't know everything about New York. I've been coming to New York City since 1939, and when I came here to the World's Fair, it was the first time I ever saw a demonstration of what they call television. Well, of course, I knew it would never work, but uh, they showed it how it could work anyway. And it's a joy and a privilege for me and my colleagues to be back here in New York. I want to thank more than 900 churches that have cooperated and worked together, and Dr. Turner, who spoke to you a moment ago, who's chairman of all this. And for Dan Southern and his group that have worked and prayed here and believed God, and Sterling Houston, who's sitting on the platform, who was their boss, and on across the city, we want to thank you for all you have done. I come in and out of New York on my way to and from other cities, or to speak at luncheons or dinners, to go to a party or to attend a conference. And for some time, I've seen signs that says, I love New York. And that's true of me. I developed a love of New York years ago. When I was playing baseball for a high school team in North Carolina, the New York Yankees came through to play an exhibition game, and I had the privilege of shaking hands with Babe Ruth. And from that moment on, I wanted to be a major league player, and I wanted to be like Babe Ruth. But I found I couldn't hit, and I found I couldn't pitch. But because of that, I was thinking of asking Stump Merrill if he didn't think it might be a good idea to let me play this last week of the schedule for the Yankees. Perhaps prayer, perhaps prayer and religion could improve their standings this year. Or perhaps we could be of help to the Mets. Anyway, I've always loved New York. And I've been here many times at Christmas, walking up and down the streets and looking at the lights like any fellow from the country would and smelling the roasting of the chestnuts. In 1957, we held a crusade in Madison Square Garden for 16 weeks. Every night, we only had empty seats on one night, and that was the second night. But every night, with some nights, we would have more people on 8th Avenue standing out there than we did inside the garden. That was an unforgettable experience for us. I never dreamed that we would be back here in 1991. Now, for the last three years, we've been going throughout New York State and have been having week-long meetings in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, Hamilton, the Nassau Coliseum on Long Island a year ago, and earlier this month in the Meadowlands across the Hudson in New Jersey. And for those of you who are visiting New York or watching by television or listening by radio, you should know why some of us have such a fondness and love for New York. Where we are... Here is Central Park, is an 840-acre beauty spot in the middle of Manhattan, which is an island. Manhattan is an island, two miles wide and 13 miles long. If you try to walk it, it seems 10 times that far, and if you go by taxi, you can be there in a minute or two. When Henry Hurt Hudson first explored and claimed Manhattan for the Dutch, it was known by its Indian name as Manahata, which means heavenly land. And for millions since, that's what it's been. It's been a heavenly land. For the seven and a half million people for whom New York is home, one-third today are immigrants who were born in another country, and another third are second-generation Americans. And we Americans have long been proud of the fact that we're the melting pot of the world, and New York is the melting pot of America. And that process, more than anywhere else, began in New York where a quarter of the people are Afro-American, where there are more Irish than in Dublin, more Hispanics than there are in Barcelona, more Jews than there are in Jerusalem, and more Italians than there are in Florence. I'm told that on a normal Sunday afternoon here in Central Park, and last Sunday afternoon we walked all over this place, and the way I was dressed, nobody recognized me. In fact, I was almost arrested. But I'm told that on a Sunday afternoon, you can hear a hundred languages spoken right here in Central Park. New York was our first capital. This was where George Washington was inaugurated, our first president. Most Americans don't know that. And New York today is the capital of the world because the United Nations is here. 
And New York may not be the political capital even of New York State, but it's certainly, as we've already heard, the financial capital with the money that has been generated and managed here during the last century and a half. New Yorkers have erected the most magnificent skyline of skyscrapers in the history of man. It boggles the imagination. There's the Empire State Building. Did you know that it's celebrating its 60th year this year? I remember when they finished it. I was a boy, a rather old boy, too, but at that time. <laughs> There's the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and the Chrysler Building and, of course, Rockefeller Center, where 160,000 people work every day, a city within a city. New York's wealth and splendor has attracted many of the world's cultural giants, as well as producing some of the former scientists, philosophers, poets, artists, and musicians. Three quarters of all the books that are published in America are published here in New York. The Metropolitan Museum of Art has perhaps the most priceless collection in the whole world. Greenwich Village is a legendary home for an endless array of writers and musicians and artists whose creations are closely watched and copied by their contemporaries throughout the world. And New York sets the fashion for the nation. It is certainly the entertainment capital of the world. On and off Broadway are 500 theaters where the plays and stars of tomorrow make their debut. But with all of this overload of vitality and variety being played out by the pace setters of world society who have clawed and climbed their way to the top of the heap, New York City is a place in desperate spiritual need. It's no, it's no secret that in New York during the last 30 years, there's been a tragic exodus from the churches into materialism, secularism, and humanism. When we were here 37 years ago, the Judeo-Christian value system provided the standard by which more lives were lived. Many were out of bounds, but they knew where the boundaries were. Today, the boundaries of what is right and wrong have been blurred and erased, and they need to be returned and it can only be returned in a spiritual awakening and revival. <laughs> New Yorkers are paying a terrible price for getting away from God. Psychiatrists are almost unanimous that New Yorkers in the 1990s are the world's most stressed people anywhere. And you're also the most lonely people in all the world. Millions are running after dollars and dreams in a rat race without realizing it. You're running away from God. And in doing so, you're running away from yourselves and too often from your families and your wives and your husbands. Yes, New York is in trouble. Sixty percent of New York's adults are singles. Chronically alone, under pressure, they reach for the bottle or for the needle or for a short-lived sexual relationship that can only end up in disillusionment. It starts with the children. Over half of New York school children are living with a single parent usually one who works or is on welfare. 20% of the teenagers, oh, pardon me, the 20% of the teenage AIDS cases in America are here in New York. Crack is the drug of the street. Cocaine of the yuppies. All of them trying to cope with the concrete jungle that is New York. Murder, rape, and crime dominate the tabloids and television news programs. The 25,000-strong police force was the most overworked and stressed in the country, as were the other 225,000 employees of the city. I told Mayor Dinkins week before last when I visited him that he and the leaders of this city would always be in my prayers, that God would be with them and help them to solve the problems of this city. But they can't solve it without your help, and they can't solve it without God's help. We're going to have to turn to God. We've turned everywhere else, and we've failed. Now let's turn to God. Some churches and synagogues, as they ponder the agonizing needs of the people, have abandoned the proclamation of our relationship with God or with Christ, and we've adopted instead a political and social agenda which, if out of balance, can leave both souls and pews empty. Everybody I talk to, it seems, agrees that New York is the loneliest place in the world. And people get increasingly irritable and pushy in their effort to guard their own turf. There's little space for others, let alone God. To be without God in New York is to be terribly lonely 
and this leads to a feeling that life is futile. A few weeks ago, the New York Times stated that the bestseller of its class was Derek Humphrey's final exit, a manual on how to commit suicide. Is that the way to terminate your life? Suicide? Many people want to turn their backs on New York. They see New York City's problems as incurable. I think we ought to stay in New York and let's do something about it to change New York. And I believe we can do it. And if New York were changed, it would touch London and Paris and all the other great cities of the world. I don't see that way, that way with, about New York. God loves New York and he has not given up on this city because he does not give up on people. As big and grand as New York buildings are, they are not New York. As wide and famous as New York City avenues are, they are not New York. As great as the plays and musicals and art and concerts are, they are not New York. New Yorkers are what make up New York. New York is a place where people live, and it's the people that God is interested in. And I'm going to speak on what I believe is the answer to the problems of your problems and the problems of New York. There is a better way. There is a way out of all this. I'm going to make my message today short, and I know that'll please you. I never did like to hear long sermons, and I still like to hear short ones. I heard about a man one time that was introduced to speak for 20 minutes, and he spoke for an hour and 10 minutes, and he was still speaking. And the man that introduced him threw a gavel in it missed him and hit a woman on the front row. And she said, hit me again, I can still hear him. And I don't want that to happen to me today. I want you to turn with me to the 16th verse of the third chapter of John. John, the third chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How many of us can say it together? Let's try all together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that is the gospel in a nutshell. That's a miniature Bible. Everything you need to know about redemption and salvation is in that one verse of Scripture. Twenty-five wonderful words that my mother taught me when she was giving me a bath on a Saturday night on a farm in North Carolina. She said, I want you to learn this passage from the Bible. And she taught me that passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Many people ask me, well, if God loves the world, why does he allow so much suffering in the world? War, disease, poverty, hate, loneliness, boredom, emptiness, psychological problems, unemployment, violence, tension, all of these things. Why doesn't God just come and stop it all? That's the question many people are asking. Some people here in New York are saying, I can't take it anymore. And they're committing suicide. The pressures of life are too great. They can't take it. Why? If there is a God, why doesn't he end it? Some people say, why has God abandoned us? But God has not abandoned us. We've abandoned him. Many of you young people here have heard the song on last year's Edge of the Century album by Styx. However, did you ever listen to the words, the lyrics? Here are the lyrics. Listen. Every night I say a prayer in the hopes that there's a heaven. But every day I'm more confused as the saints turn into sinners. All the heroes and legends I knew as a child have fallen as idols of clay. And I feel this empty place inside, so afraid that I've lost my faith. Show me the way. Show me the way. Bring me tonight to the mountain and take my confusion away. And show me the way. And if I see a light, should I believe? Tell me how I will know. Show me the way. Show me the way. Take me tonight to the river and wash my illusions away. Show me the way. Show me the way. Give me the strength and the courage to believe that I'll get there someday. And please show me the way. And every night 
I say a prayer in the hopes that there's a heaven. And this passage says, for God, for God. Do you believe in God? Yes. I can't prove God. I can't take you to a scientific laboratory and prove to you that there is a God. But the Bible teaches us about him. He is the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All those stars at night that you see, if you can see them in New York, God created them and started them. He is also a spirit. The Bible says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He doesn't have a body like you and I. He could only be one place at one time if he had a body like yours. But God is a spirit. He can be everywhere at the same time. He can be in Russia. He can be in China. He can be in America. He can be in Africa. He can be in Latin America. He can be everywhere at the same time. God is also unchanging. I am the Lord God. I change not, says the Bible. In him is no variable, neither shadow of turning, says James. The Bible teaches that God is a holy God, absolutely holy. He cannot even look upon sin. The Bible also tells us that he's a God of judgment. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Think of it, every secret thing you ever did, all your secret thoughts, things that you thought nobody knew about are someday going to be brought into the open and you're going to be judged. The Bible says that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Think of it. He's appointed a day, a moment, in which he's going to judge the world and you'll be there. God, but God also is a God of love. My mother loved me, but she didn't love me near as much as God loves me. And that seems impossible to believe. My wife loves me. I love her. I have five children. I love them. I have 19 grandchildren. I love them. And I hope they love me. I have three great-grandchildren. I think they love me and I love them. And I know that they all love the Lord. But nothing is to be compared to the love of God. They had to invent a whole new word in the Greek language to tell us something about the love of God. God is a God of love. He loves you. And if there's one thing I want you to take from this great park when you leave here today, it's this. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And God is interested in you. And he has the hairs of your head numbered. He sees the sparrow fall. He knows all about you and he loves you. No matter how many sins you've committed or whatever you've done, you may have gone as low as Nicky Cruz described a moment ago his life was, but God loves you. And if God could change Nicky Cruz and change Johnny Cash... God can change you if you will let him. And he can do it today, beginning right now. Yes, God is a God of judgment. He'll bring every work into judgment. And he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world. But God is also the God of love. Nothing compared to the love of God. The Bible says God is love. Yea, I have loved thee with a love that's everlasting, says Jeremiah. And for this reason, God created man. Have you ever wondered why you're here? Why God created the human race? And what's the purpose of the human race? God created you because he's a God of love. And he wanted some other creatures in the universe that could choose to love him in return. And so he created man, Adam and Eve. He put them in a perfect paradise. And we believe that that was located in the country that's now called Iraq, at the head of the Persian Gulf. Much of the Bible was written in Iraq, Nineveh, Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees where Abraham came from. And Abraham is the father of the Jews and the Christians and the Islamic people. Abraham is the one we all look to as the beginning. He came from Iraq. And that's the reason there was so much interest in Iraq during the Gulf War. That's why the, so many books were written from the Bible about the Gulf and God created man and put him in that Garden of Eden, that perfect environment, that perfect paradise. And God gave man a choice. And God said, I, can, I want you to have all the fruit of the garden except one tree. You can't eat of that one tree. God was testing man. And God said, if you eat of that tree, you are going to break my law 
you're going to suffer and you're going to die. And man broke God's law. God gave him a free will to choose and man chose to rebel against God. I heard a TV talk show the other day. You can listen to nearly all of them and they're discussing what's wrong with human nature. Why do people do the things they do? Why do people commit the crimes they do? Why do people tell the lies they tell? Why is there so much jealousy? Why are there so many problems in the world? It's because man has a disease and the disease is called sin. What's the basic cause of war and crime and deceit and fraud? Why do we have to have hospitals and jails with bars and windows and police forces and military forces? Our social problems are basically moral and spiritual problems. And the moral problems require a religious solution. All these problems indicate that something is wrong with human nature. People have been looking to technology or political force to save us. But God says, your problem is in your hearts. The first sin ever committed was committed in a paradise. It's a heart problem. Jesus said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and thefts and blasphemy. The Bible says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. The Bible says sin is a breaking of the law. What law? The law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience? Then you've committed a sin. Have you ever broken one of the Ten Commandments? Then you're a sinner. Have you ever failed to keep the requirements of the Sermon on the Mount? Then you're a sinner. We've come short of what God requires. And we're sinners before God. And sin comes between you and God. And comes between you and peace. Between you and happiness. Between you and joy. And between you and the assurance that if you died, you're going to heaven. Solomon, the great king of Israel, once said, There is no man that sinneth not. We are alienated from God. Let's remember that. We are separated from God. But in spite of that, he still loves us. Yes, there is a hell. There's a hell in this life, but there's also a hell in the life to come if we keep, if we are separated from God. The Bible teaches that death has three dimensions. There's natural death. When you die, you're going to be buried or you're going to be cremated or however you're, they're going to handle you. We disappear from this earth. But there's also spiritual death. Living inside of you as your soul or your spirit. That's the part of you that lives forever. That's the part of you that can have fellowship with God. And you have broken God's law, and as a result of it, you're spiritually dead. You're dead toward God. And that death will continue throughout eternity after you're dead. And you're not going to be out there with thousands of people having a good time, as many people describe hell. You're going to be all alone. You're going to be, there'll be a terrible loneliness to it all. And that's what hell is. And we can have hell in this life and hell in the life to come. And that's called eternal death. Words in the New Testament used by Christ to describe the penalty of sin is lost, perish, condemned, punishment, hell. God saw all this confusion and saw us stumbling in darkness. We didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were either bored on the one hand or we were physically dying on the other. So God decided to do something about it because of his love. God couldn't just forgive us or he would break his own word. He wouldn't be God. He had said that if you sin, you're going to die. If you sin, you're going to suffer. We had to suffer. We had to die so God's word could be kept. One day I was walking with one of my sons along a road in North Carolina. We stepped on an anthill and we looked down and we saw those ants dying and suffering and saw their little house destroyed, and my son said to me, Dad, wouldn't it be great if we could uh, help those ants rebuild our house, take them to their hospitals? I said, yes, but we're too big and they're too little. Then I thought, what a wonderful illustration. God looked down from heaven and saw us with all of our darkness, with all of our stumbling and all of our problems and fightings and bickerings and difficulties and wars But God was too big. We were too small. We looked like little ants crawling on this planet. What could God do? God decided to do something about it. God became a man. God became a man. 
and that man was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and he came for one purpose. He came to save you and to save me and to save the world. And he came to die. He's the only man that was ever born just for the purpose of dying. He took our sins on the cross. They took him outside of Jerusalem and nailed him. The Romans did, not the Jews. The Romans took him outside the walls of Jerusalem and nailed him on a cross. And he shed his blood. And in that terrible moment when he was hanging there, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible moment, he made seven agonizing expressions. And in those expressions, he was telling us that he had taken our sins. He was made to be sin for us. Think of it, he was made to be sin. He became guilty of your adultery. He became guilty of all the sex sins that you've committed. He became guilty of all the envy and the jealousy and the fighting and the killing and the murders that you read about in the newspapers almost every day. He hath made him to be sin for us. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Think of it. He took our sins. Now what do we have to do? We have to repent of our sins. All through the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets said, Repent. The first sermon Jesus ever preached was repent. And all through the New Testament, they wrote repent, 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 repent. What does the word repentance mean? It means that you confess to God, I have sinned against your Lord. I'll admit it. It means that you turn from your sins. You're willing to let God have his way in your life. And you're ready to follow him and serve him from now on. That's repentance. A few days ago... In our daily bread entitled, Take Me to the Cross, Cliff Barrows gave me this wonderful little story. A policeman, an officer, was patrolling on night duty in a town in northern Great Britain when he heard a quivering sob. He saw a little boy in the shadows sitting on a doorstep, tears rolling down his cheeks. The child said, I'm lost. Please take me home. The policeman began naming street after street trying to help the boy remember where he lived. He named the shops and the hotels in the area, but all without success. Then he remembered. In the center of the town was a church with a large white cross towering high above the surrounding city. He pointed to it and said, Do you live anywhere near that? The boy's face immediately brightened. Yes, sir. Take me to the cross. I can find my way home from there. And if you come to the cross today, there is a way if you come by the way of the cross. If you're lost, the only way home is to come to the cross. The cross of Christ directs lost people to their eternal home. But Jesus didn't stay on a cross. He rose from the dead. God raised him from the dead. And I'm not speaking to you about a dead Christ. I'm speaking to you about a living Christ. And this living Christ is going to, can come into your heart today by the Holy Spirit and make you a new person, give you a new outlook on life. Take away that loneliness. Take away all those sins that you've committed and wipe them away so that when God sees you, he never sees your sins. You are justified in his sight as though you'd never sinned. And then the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back again someday. I was in Jerusalem. And I was talking one day to the chief rabbi. And I asked him, I said, sir, do you believe that Messiah is coming back? He said, oh, yes. I said, I do too. But I said, I believe when he comes, you're going to notice that he's Jesus Christ. He laughed for a moment over his cup of coffee. And he said, he didn't laugh, he just smiled. He said, of course, that's our difference. We're both looking for Messiah. But we believe that it's going to be Jesus Christ. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory with power and great glory. He's coming back and he's going to set up his kingdom. Yes. Communism did not win. No ism is going to win. Only Christ is going to win. And someday, 
someday he's going to rule the world. But tonight he wants to rule your heart. He wants to come into your home, into your family, into your neighborhood. He wants to come into our country. And he wants to be king of kings and lord of lords. Now what does God require of you? I've already told you about one thing, repentance. During this past week we've been celebrating the holiest days of the Jewish year. Yom Kippur, which is celebrated on Wednesday, is intensely personal. The Jewish holidays ask three questions. What have we done our li- what have we done with our life during the past year? Where are we now in our life? What do we plan to do with our life in the coming year? And one reason that Yom Kippur exercises such an enormous grip upon the Jewish people is because the holiday theme is so personal and contemporary. There's not a person among the people that can say, my life is complete and spiritually filled. We all fall short. And we have to say with everyone else, I too am a sinner. I'm separated from God. I'm lost. I need to find my way home. It's not an option. It's a command. In Acts 17, the apostle in his sermon says God commands all men everywhere to repent. Think of it. God commands it. It's a command for you to repent. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? If you haven't repented of your sins, you'll never see the inside of the kingdom of heaven. And then you come by faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. You'll never be able to work your way to heaven. You have to come by faith in Christ. And you come by the grace of God. Grace means it's something you don't deserve. You can't work for. You come by faith in Him. That's how I came. By simple childlike faith. You say, Billy, those are such simple things. Jesus spoke with such simplicity about spiritual things that the children heard Him gladly. And we're we're to make it simple. It's a profound truth, but it's to be proclaimed in simplicity. And all of you today that are willing to say, I will repent of my sins, I receive Christ as Savior, I want to follow Him and serve Him, or I want to rededicate myself. You might want to renew your vows that you took at confirmation or at baptism or whenever it was. And you want to say, Lord, I want to come back to you. I've wandered away from you and I've gotten confused and lost. And I want Christ to be first in my life. I want him to forgive my sins. I want to come to the cross. And I want to follow him from now on. Hold up your hand. Yes, there are many people with hands up. And there are so many people standing. I can't ask you to stand because you wouldn't stand out. And there are four things from now on that are very important. First... Read the Bible every day. The Bible is food for your soul. Secondly, pray. Perhaps you cannot pray like a clergyman, but you can say, Lord, help me. I'm in need of help. He'll come and help you. He'll answer your prayer. Pray it in Christ's name. Say, Lord Jesus, I I need you. And then the third thing, witness for Christ. You ought to tell some people when you go home tonight or tell people tomorrow, you know, at that great lawn meeting, I made a commitment to Christ and I mean to keep it with God's help. That'll help you to win other people to Christ. And then the fourth thing is get into the church. Into a church where Christ is proclaimed and follow him and serve him as best you can because you see when you leave here you won't leave alone the spirit of God goes with you and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me pray it out loud oh God I am a sinner I'm sorry for my sin I'm willing to turn from my sin I receive Christ as Savior I confess him as Lord from this moment on. I want to follow him and serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Christ's name, amen. 